Hi folks, my name is Mike Dobbs. I'm your host for Government Matters here on Focus Springfield. And today we've got State Senator Adam Gomez, who is running for re-election. Uh, we have invited Senator Gomez and his challenger, City Councilor Malo Brown, to do some interviews one-on-one. -on -one. Later on, the plan is to have a debate between these two candidates. Adam, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me, Mike. I really appreciate being here. Thank no problem. Springfield. So, um, I did my research, and you have been extremely active in the Senate, sponsoring, uh, promoting various legislation. I went to your website. You're doing a lot. Um, did you say that you had put in like some sort of 90 bills this session? I think we're we're about uh, 90 pieces of legislation at this moment. Um, sometimes, um, you know, it gets a. Uh, it gets a little bit of ahead of itself, you know, sometimes because of the issues are so important. And, um, you know, and, and all of them go through its process, but about 90 bills. Just for a moment, before we get into some of those issues, I, I just want people to understand there's a lot of legislation that's proposed every year in, in the State House. Um, and that when they're able to get something through, it actually really is an accomplishment. Absolutely. There's thousands of bills. So one thing I think individuals don't understand, you know, their constituents is that there's 200 members of the legislature and there's 40 senators and there's 160 representatives. And all of us have our priorities and we all file our bills um, in the first, uh, I would say, two months of uh, once the legislative season starts, when the session starts after we're sworn in. And I think some people, when they come in at first, it kind of is like uh, drinking from a water hose. That's kind mm -hmm. of what, the, what it felt like for me. Um, I didn't know that I needed all my bills ready right then and there. Right. But right. Um, some pieces of legislation that necessarily they're still being worked out in committees where they're assigned after you file your bills, um, you know, some of them need to get redrafted. Maybe they don't make it to the floor that first session. Because sometimes pieces of legislation, it takes time for it to develop and obviously work with uh, the committee chairs and also the advocates and everybody that's part of the, you know, pushing these, uh, these type of narratives. And then from there, uh, working it out with, uh, with leadership. And then hopefully this is a piece of legislation that they can see if it has, it's accompanied by uh, a partner in the House or the Senate. Um, we can see that piece of legislation hit the floor and come out of Ways and Means, which uh, this session I've been honored to be a part of uh, the Ways and Means Committee. So um, something that's just come up this week, but it's a culmination of a lot of stories. Uh, I, I saw that one of your colleagues in the Senate is calling for receivership of the Cannabis Control Commission because the, the commission has been greatly criticized for any number of legitimate reasons, uh, not the least of which is that um, uh, the chair has been removed from the, the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, Shannon O'Brien. I know that you've been involved in, in cannabis um, legislation. I was just wondering what your take is on the, uh, the status of the commission and, and how that status may be affecting uh, businesses here in Massachusetts. Well, we do know that it's no secret there are some challenges at the commission at the moment. I think now acting chair Ava Concepcion has been doing the very best that she can with what she has there. You know, we're, we're down one commissioner, obviously, which is the outgoing or in question, um, the, the chair that was removed, uh, that now we uh, can't really talk too much about that because there is a pending, um, pending lawsuit right. um, that's um, happening between her and the appointer, which is um, uh, Treasurer Deb Goldberg. Um, from that matter, uh, I think that um, there is still some uh, policy that's going to come out. Um, I think this Thursday they have a, a, a big meeting where we're going to see some policy changes. I think that from the narrative that I've received from the commissioners that I've met with, um, uh, no secret to our community, uh, Commissioner um, Bruce Stebbins and also Commissioner uh, Nourish Camargo, and I can't really think of the other commissioner's name, is that, that I know that there's going to be some traction. They are working diligently and hard 
uh, to move different policies forward, especially when it comes to the commission. I know that uh, media has played a, a huge part in confusion, but there is uh, really some critical things that need to happen in the cannabis industry because there's some operators that are definitely suffering right now, especially with um, trying to figure out how to bring in these. One, understand this, uh, this industry, and I know that um, it's been very difficult to maneuver. I think that municipalities uh, have a, a great buy-in, especially with these operators. And uh, when it comes to the host community agreement, trying to figure out how much money you absolutely need to uh, uh, get into this industry. And just this past uh, year, we had a round one of just only $2.2 million to go out, out of a fund that was created for equitable applicants that have been impacted um, by, the, uh, by marijuana. But I know that there's gonna be another round where it has a lot more uh, resources. And one thing in the legislature that I was looking for is trying to create not only for the equitable licenses, but other operators that are like mom and pops, really small, uh, individuals that want to get involved with the industry, how to make sure that they can stay afloat and compete with the MSOs, which a MSO is a multi-state um, operator, which has a multitude of different operations in states that have legalized um, a cannabis. I, um, there was recently a cannabis event um, here in Springfield. It was a business-to-business -business meeting. Um, and um, my boss, Steve Carey, who's out there in the darkness, um, and I were invited to go. And it was very interesting what people were saying to us. But one thing that was talked about is that by September or October, uh, commissioners are hoping to have some sort of policy statement plan for smoking lounges. Absolutely, social consumption. And So that's what we're looking on seeing coming out hopefully on Thursday, some regulations that are gonna come out on social consumption. And also, um, if it's not gonna be Thursday, it's gonna be sometime soon around the time frame that you had suggested. But um, what we're looking at too is a, um, policies behind um, delivery as well. Right. And that can open up capacity, open up uh, ways that these, um, these businesses and small businesses can open up other revenue streams to keep them afro afloat with what's happening in the industry. And I was invited to that same event, I think it was at White Lion. Yes. And it was uh, um, hosted by Peyton Shubrick and a co collaborative that I, I, I work with in the state. And it was about 50 businesses that wanted me to be there because these 50 businesses are in trouble. Not only those are the 50 businesses that came together, but they're absolutely looking towards if no action is being taken, um, not necessarily from the CCC or by the legislature, that they can voluntarily hand in their licenses, which is detrimental, especially when the prohibition is over. And what the legislature, before I was part of it, uh, when I was on the city council, um, when we crafted the zoning ordinance to bring cannabis to, to the city of Springfield, um, it's supposed to be able to open doors for those individuals. And the reason why I kind of, um, I, I push that, that, that narrative is because when I was 17, I was one that um, was charged with a mandatory minimum with a regular possession with intent. Um, and from there, I was able in 2022 to amend and work with the, the administration that you have seen that we've been able to pardon simple possession right. that we just passed. And then in 2022, what I was just talking about was we've passed in the cannabis bill, which was led by myself um, in the Senate to be able to expunge possession with intent under two ounces. So individuals that um, leisurely just um, uh, uh, use cannabis, medicinal or not, and if they were in, in the past were caught with marijuana, which we knew a lot of people were charged with possession with intent, especially when they're younger, that hinders them from having housing, certain yep. job placements, and also when people uh, like myself um, can have, uh, when opportunities come about within jobs, that that doesn't hinder them from being able to, uh, to have a thriving, uh, uh, a thriving future. Do you see, um, do you see smoking lounges happening? Yeah, I do see um, social consumption happen. There was one social consumption when cannabis first started. I think it was called the Summit Lounge or something. It was in Worcester. In Worcester. Yeah, I went. I did a story on it. I went yeah, there right. to see how they they ran so it. So there was like a loophole that yep. ended up happening, and they ended up being kind of one of the first and only ones in the state to be able to have this type of establishment because of that loophole, and obviously it was closed. So now there's going to be some necessary. Uh, 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 
uh, some necessary legislation and policy that's coming out of the CCC that, because um, we have individuals that come here for business, come here for leisure, that visit the Berkshires or visit Boston, probably want to go catch a game, catch a Red Sox game. Can um, We have uh, definitely, definitely a lot of, uh, of things for people to come and be a part of here, of, of the fabric of what the Commonwealth has to offer. And when they come here, there's regulations on smoking inside, right? So individuals that want to maybe uh, visit a, a dispensary, grab some gummies, or maybe grab uh, what, whatever it is that they need, um, it's still illegal for you to smoke in public or right. to, 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 right. to, um, to be able to use. So we want to create these, uh, this element where individuals aren't necessarily risking um, their hotel stay but they're not risking smoking in the car, driving under the influence, and also being able to take part in the industry and smoke in a safe place or eat in a safe place. Because these social consumption spots could be uh, eateries that have um, uh, infused, uh, infused food as well. So those are different ways that cannabis can get expanded. I know there's a different opinion when it comes to cannabis, just like alcohol. And I think with the end of a prohibition, we have to understand that just like alcohol, um, we have to treat cannabis as well because they're both substances that obviously were illegal for some time and then obviously the stigma slowly has went away because now we have pouring establishments unfortunately on every single corner in communities of color. That's another uh, uh, topic, right? But one thing we have to understand, we're, there's still a cap on where right. these um, cannabis uh, um, businesses can be. And then it's on to the municipality, like myself, that I was charged with, with um, my colleagues at that time, which we have to create the zoning ordinance on where these establishments can go and where they would uh, better suit and they can thrive in. So recently the Pioneer Valley Project had a, a meeting um, and uh, one of the things that they discussed is trying to make the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority, the PVTA, free. Now, I know that you've been involved in some legislation involving um, commuters and mass transit. Um, I just was wondering what you thought about that and if it's, if it's something that would require state support, if, if you think that in the legislature this would be something that could be supported. I think a lot of folks um, would love to see Springfield uh, where it's a hub of, you know, individuals that live in um, impoverished communities to be able to get to point A to point B uh, fairly quickly at a subsidized rate. Um, the truth is when the PVTA has, um, for the holidays, has uh, offered this free ridership, we've seen uh, an uptick of ridership. People are utilizing uh, transportation. And when I was on the city council, um, I remember when the, the transit authority would come and tell us that they're going to take away spots because it's low ridership. And, um, and now what we look at is hopefully uh, for their 50th anniversary, if I'm correct, I think it was 50th, they're doing all rides all summer. And then individuals that are like at, um, are still in school that have their school ID, those students can be able to, in high school, can be able to ride for free during certain time frames to bring up ridership. Um, I do believe that in certain cities here in the Commonwealth, we've seen that the that the um, the transit authorities have been able, or what the city has bought in to the idea of making free rides. I think that this is something that we have to talk about, and we have to fully understand what's the cost, what's the burden. If there's a if there's a, a partnership between the state and the city to be able to make that happen, I know now I'm talking to individuals and advocates out of San Francisco which um, are absolutely pushing this forward through a, a possible tax. Um, but that tax would be on ridership through like Uber and Lyft to be able to supplement some of that stuff. So it's all in the, in the craft and the details of what the legislation can look like and how to support this. But I think that Pioneer Valley Project is having a conversation that's really important to make sure that individuals that having problems with food insecurity, getting to their doctor's appointments, getting to certain areas, you know, that is not gonna cost them on figuring out, do I get to my doctor's appointment or can I put food on the table? Because of one, uh, trying to get to a certain place because they don't have right. a, a, a source of transportation. And unfortunately, um, um, people who do suffer from poverty, there's been studies about the impact of them not having a car or not being able to use the bus. And if they use taxis, that's expensive oh. for them. Uh, Uber and Lyft, they're convenient, but they're not cheap. 
And if, if you don't have a car or you don't have the ability to get someplace on your own, um, yes, that's an alternative, but the bus is a better solution. Yeah, it, and, it, and it also spurs economic development. I know that downtown <clears throat> isn't what it used to be as vibrant, you know, as many stores, but if you give individuals a chance to get down here, they can support um, right. downtown or different um, uh, economic development areas that they would love to be able to, to patronize, but if they can't get there because of a $1.50 or something, how can we make sure that we can, we can make that happen? And, and, and it starts off with an idea, it starts off with a conversation, and then it leads into possible legislation and partnership right. through the municipality and our state legislature. So I, I noticed that there was a story up on State House News Service about the uh, about Work and Family Mobility Act, which I believe that you were involved in, um, and they said that after one year, they've noticed 128,000 licenses, driver's license, were issued, and many of those were going to undocumented undocumented immigrants, which was the whole point of that act. Um, and the story was people are saying this is is a success. How do you feel about it? Well, I was one of the lead sponsors on the Work and Family Mobility Act. Um, making uh, roads safer um, because we do know that there is a community of undocumented individuals that live within the Commonwealth, specifically here in Springfield, which um, I worked with that community as a ward counselor very uh, exclusively because predominantly the, the migrant community that, co that was coming here at that time and, and living here for decades, they needed a safe way to get to point A to point B without creating an unsafe environment for driving. Individuals need to get to school, get to their, um, uh, also to, to, to their healthcare uh, appointments and also to work. Because a lot of these individuals, uh, there's this stigma of these individuals are gonna get this license and then evidently they were gonna uh, register to vote. And that is, uh, we have seen instances across the nation where people, even citizens have uh, uh, voted when they weren't supposed to. But here in the Commonwealth, we, we believe and knew that individuals that lived in a mixed family, what we call, is maybe the father's undocumented, but the mom is here on, uh, on some type of protection, maybe a TPS uh, or, or DACA with the children, that the children end up becoming uh, citizens when they're born here. So they are American. So at the end of it, we wanted to make sure that we created a safe environment for the streets that if there was maybe a minor fender bender, an individual doesn't feel like he needs to do a hit and run or maybe right. uh, clog right. the system uh, uh, of our, and, and making sure that individuals are, are insured as well. So we had a buy-in and it took quite some time to get this done. Um, I came in in my first session and um, partnered with, with the coalition and it was a success and we see that it's been a revenue booster for the state as well when it comes to insurances as well and also uh, licenses, which now we have individuals that are licensed, that are insured and also have learned the rules of the road and have went through uh, the proper channels to make sure that they're on our road safely. So part of that whole issue, which other states talk about as well, is this paranoia that you just brought up that somehow people who are not American citizens or registered to vote are going to wind up voting in elections. But in Massachusetts, that hasn't been an issue, has it? No. Um, that's something that uh, I would say people with a difference of opinion, um, I guess they get the shock and on depending on where they're getting their news from. And that's the problem, you know, without stating the facts and understanding. When an individual that is undocumented comes to Massachusetts, or we've been giving um, licenses for years to migrants already, individuals that have moved here that have come with status. And then and the, uh, inevitably they make a life here and then they fall out of status and that's what makes them undocumented as well. Um, but there hasn't been no uh, real evidence that shows that uh, a, a bunch of undocumented individuals um, have been voting illegally. I think that there's a, and within the paperwork as well, once they're filling it out, they can't, um, they need proper documentation from their country uh, also to be able to, uh, we're not just giving out license to individuals. Right. We have to, we go through a, a, a really uh, strong, identi uh, uh, identif uh, to identify these individuals and obviously from there, you know, um, 
these individuals, they don't, there's an option always to uh, register to vote. That option is never, because uh, they're not going to create a federal offense just to, uh, to, to be able to drive their families to point A to point B. Right. I think that, that that's just a misconception, unfortunately. Um, one thing I noticed, again, on, on your website, with the legislation that you have been involved in, um, this sort of like falls under the classification of what the heck? Uh, the hairstyles okay. legislation that, that you've been involved in supporting. I had no idea that people were being criticized in the 21st century for their hairstyle that they wear to work. And yet there is, uh, there are people who've been sent home and kids who've been kicked out of school because their hairstyle. Um, and, and obviously there's legislation that would make that kind of, um, uh, that kind of response illegal. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that legislation? So it's called the Crown Act, and the Crown Act is a national um, uh, coalition that goes to state to state where we've seen this discriminatory acts, which they call and they use in the, sa in the same vein of professionalism to be able to dictate uh, an individual's uh, character or, um, or their biases towards their natural appearance, um, which happens strongly in the black community which individuals and, and also in the Latino community that um, they wear their hairstyle, maybe they, they grow out their hairstyle in, in dreadlocks or uh, they wear micro braids or maybe they want to uh, wear their natural um, um, afro. You know, I think that um, one thing is evident is that we all come from different um, backgrounds. Uh, we have different culture and the way that we dress is uh, different from another person, from another culture, another, uh, another background. And I think that when uh, I was introduced to this uh, coalition um, from uh, a member of my campaign that is on, uh, on the coalition, um, his name is Leslie Braxton Campbell, he uh, brought this forward. I met with the coalition members on the national level, and I was able to uh, partner with um, uh, Assistant Majority Leader Saudi Domenico and be able to push this and usher this uh, piece of legislation to make sure that students, right, and also um, their parents or families that uh, work in professional settings aren't discriminated against because of their natural hairstyle. Um, uh, a way that they do their hair shouldn't um, be, uh, I guess, they shouldn't be ridiculed off of their professionalism. It has, it's about their work ethic. And if uh, someone wants to uh, go to work with pink hair, somebody wants to wear their dreads down their back, or like myself, I have no, no. Uh, <laughs> You're not uh, really affected by this. I'm not really <laughs> affected by it, but you know, uh, I think that, uh, go figure, uh, me, myself, uh, a bald person, if I could have hair, I'd wear it all the way down my back if they would let me. <laughs> well, I, 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 that really struck me because to me, you would think that this is the least of anyone's concern, that if a person is professional in the workplace, yeah. if a person is doing his or her job, um, gets along with colleagues, that would be the standard for, quote, judging someone, not if they have it, a hairstyle it, that you don't have. It happened here in the Commonwealth. That's the, that's the crazy point, right? Like, this is a, a beacon of light. This is the, the beginning of our democracy. Um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we had a private school that went out and suspended this young girl because she was wearing braids or, or, or locks in her hair, which is her natural hair, is part of our, her culture. And then just recently, we seen the same kind of school with an individual that wore a hijab. You know, and, and that's the thing is that our diversity is our strength here. And one thing we have to understand is that um, we all, and like hair is a person's identity. You know, that's a part of who they are. And when we put people in corners to not be themselves, then we will never be and never see a person's true self and bringing 110% because they're always living in fear when they go to school. And that's something, you know, when it, it could affect their mental health and also in the workplace where, you know, we want a cohesive, workable environment and not anybody ever feeling because of their natural hairstyle 
or the way that they put their hair or the color of their hair or if they want to shave it all bald, they're going to look, be looked at cross-eyed right. or be sent home and be able not to put food on the table because of who they are and, um, and what their culture is or who they are. So uh, I want in this conversation, uh, this conversation, I know we're going to have more, um, about what you see as, the, uh, as several big challenges facing our district. You know, um, uh, your district is most of Springfield or a good chunk of Springfield and then a little corner of Chicopee, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we have seven eighths of Springfield. I have all the way from wards one, ward two, three, four, five. We have uh, a good chunk of six, so I don't have six B or six D. I have uh, ward eight entirely, and then I have seven A and seven H. Um, so about a ward of Springfield is in mind, and when you look at it, it's about eight precincts. We call it kind of the long metal side, in essence, um, sometimes on the other side of the park. But then in Chicopee, I also have uh, about a good majority of Chicopee, too, which is half of Chicopee. We, we've lost West Springfield in redistricting, and it was gained by uh, John Velas because of the depopulization of how the migration of individuals moving east out of western Massachusetts. So uh, I'm very proud of representing the Hamden District, two great gateway cities. And one of the biggest challenges inevitably is going to be uh, housing and okay. housing stabilization, um, job creation, uh, stagnant wages, um, making sure that with the rise of inflation, um, what we've seen is individuals here in the Hamden District um, having hard times being able to pay for food and pay for rent. Um, about 600 applications go for rent stabilization, two wayfinders a week. Um, this is something important and real and off the cusp of us passing the housing bond bill, you know, there is still practices of housing discrimination that is happening also within the district and also with individuals that are, are probably have some no fault evictions and that hinders them from being able to uh, be able to live in the neighborhood that they lived in because of certain uh, uh, developments that are coming on that they can't afford. Yeah, it's good because um, we need to create about 15,000 new units within Western Massachusetts, not just in the city of Springfield, but we need to start looking at the local AMI and not the regional AMI and looking at um, the residents of Springfield and how we can sustain and make sure that these individuals can stay in their homes and be able to pay uh, their rent and put food on the table for their children. And also we got to look at our elderly as well because our elderly, once they retire, lived on a fixed income. And with the rising skyrocketing rates that are happening here, it, it, it's, we're seeing more and more of our elderly becoming homeless. So we need to start putting our money um, where our mouth is and start really stabilizing our, um, the individuals that live here, specifically in the Commonwealth. Because um, if we don't do anything about it, if we don't start having these conversations, which have been happening with a coalition uh, of homelessness, um, here in, in Western Massachusetts. Commonwealth of Massachusetts alone is short 200,000, 200,000 units. With the growing, um, we, 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 with the crumbling infrastructure, we have to sustain what we have now. That's what we did with the housing bond bill. Um, and that means with Springfield Housing Authority and different um, um, you know, uh, uh, units that we have that are in question, that's always been in question down in the South End, and then in different parts of the city that we need to be able to infuse funding to make sure that we can repair those units that we have and then continue building. I know that the administration has said that this year they have 600 units that are coming on board, which is fantastic right across from here. We have a great development on Elm Street that happened, cost a boatload of money. Um, and there was a lot of taxpayer money that went into that development. But some of those individuals that paid into their taxes can't even afford to live in that development right. because of the, sky, the, the skyrocketing rate. Not saying it's a bad, uh, a, a bad investment. Obviously, we need to create these types of, um, these types of housing. But in, the, uh, but in the end, we also need to start looking at all the developments to make sure that there's a mixed use with it that has some type of affordability or some kind of a, um, a, a stabilization, maybe, so we can move forward with that. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges is food insecurity and housing. And then we have a lot of commercial uh, empty properties here um, 
on Main Street that I think that we need to look towards maybe because of the dynamic after the pandemic that individuals can work from home now. And I know a lot of companies have used that and now it's becoming a traditional aspect. We want people to come into work, but people are getting more work and, and more efficiency out of in the individuals that have created a space at home that they can work from home. And um, it, it, it's definitely been a help for some companies. But now the commercial real estate industry is gonna suffer because they can't have commercial tenants. So what would we do? Let's infuse some money in downtown uh, USA, specifically in the Commonwealth, because it's not just in Springfield, it's happening all over in gateway cities, and we can take some of this commercial real estate and transfer it into housing. Sounds very good. Sander, thank you much for coming in today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for the opportunity, and I just wanna tell folks if they wanna read up on any type of my um, information and pieces of legislation, or any, anything from my office on the state side, you can just um, adamgomezma.com, and all of the information there, you can request uh, 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 an appointment and request a citation and also look at the legislation that we have filed for this in the past four years that I've been and proud to serve the Hamden District, Springfield, and Chicopee. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, folks, for watching another, another episode here of Government Matters on Focus Springfield.